Should we jump into it, mate? Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, let's do it. Right, so again, this could go all over the place. So I'll just start somewhere mm. nice and big. Yeah. Actually, maybe this yeah. can be a, a topical way to start. I, what I was thinking of, of asking you about is since everyone at the moment is so worried about viruses and the concept of some kind, I mean, obviously the ultimate thing about a virus is it's the idea that it's the invisible contagion where you don't even know who has yeah, it or what's yeah. going to happen. You know, it's, 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 there's a good mm. reason why there's so many movies being made about this, this plot. It's brilliant grist if you're a, mm. if you're a horror writer as to how to yeah, re-inspire yeah. a generation that, you know, doesn't believe in ghosts and stuff. So what I thought was good is if we use that as an analogy, because obviously, I mean, oh, yeah, sadly, a lot of people yeah. listening to this aren't going to know this, but, the term meme, which mm. now everyone knows as a funny joke that passes around the internet. Obviously, the root mm. of that as memetics, which you've talked about in many of your videos, was kind of the idea of mm. let's treat ideas as if they were like genes, or in this case, you could easily make a comparison yeah. to viruses if you if you don't like the ide ideology yeah. that we're refer I'm about to refer to. So mm. what I would say is this. One thing I found a very interesting concept that I heard a lot of people talk about during this period of this virus lockdown was the idea that you actually... All right, I'll give you a very quick analogy to, to make sense of it, right? When I was a boy... Like a lot of people, I didn't like spiders, Ramsey. If I saw a spider, and it's, except if it was tiny, mm. if it was over, let's say, the size of like a 10 pence piece, that was scary to me, you mm. know, just the concept of it, that, yeah. that could yeah. exist, such an alien thing, and, you know, and it was right next to me, and it's nothing about it I could relate to. But someone once told me, mm. someone who understood about kind of like the biological world, they said, actually, don't ever be too worried, because first of all, you know, to find the really big spies, you've got to go to like South America or somewhere, we're in England, you know, don't worry about that. And then secondly, they told me something that was mm. very comforting, if it's true, which is that apparently the way that a spider breathes through like holes on its legs or something bizarre means that actually All in right. the world we live in, they can't get beyond a certain size or they can't breathe or something to that effect. So essentially there'll never be a horror movie of you go to an island like King Kong <laughs> and there's the 700 foot spider, which obviously would have been my childhood nightmare in that scenario, right? So when I heard that, I thought, oh, phew, that is actually a comforting thought. It's almost like there is a, there's a rationale to the world. So similarly, I heard something mm. similar about viruses actually. I heard basically that if it's too effective, at spreading and too effective at killing people, then it basically will sort of mm. burn itself out. Like it, it can't sort of get around yes. the whole world essentially. Because, yes. you know, how would people pass it from one to the other if yeah. it was too effective at killing you immediately? So what I want to ask was, since mm. you've done so much work in, on memetics as a topic and use this, it's obviously a very clever way to hook people into kind of like, spoiler if they haven't ever heard about magic. That essentially is just mm. like a secular way of describing a kind of magic, the way we use symbols and language to affect affect reality mm. so my question yes. would be this of everyone in the political climate is incredibly scared of the notion that there's an ideology now you can pick what that might be depending on what your background is what country you happen to be in everyone's scared there's an ideology that's going to take over the whole world the entire world will become in the past it would have been a religion in the modern day totalitarian government or you know what some sort of dystopian free-for-all of techno capitalists there's all these concepts that if they spread to the whole thing we're all fucked mm. and that as a result, our our job now is if you if you're scared of that, you've got to be the vanguard against it. You've got to be vigilant and look for it everywhere. You know, you can see why it really does draw parallel mm -hmm. to the virus angle, right? As someone who, yeah. like, I, I would say <laughs> it's a bizarre title to give you, but you're someone who's basically studied ideology, the, the concepts that, are, that lie mm -hmm. belie these things your whole life. That's been part of what you've done in your in your magical in your writing. So, so what I would ask is, what do, what do you think about that topic? Like, can ideology? Do you think ever consume the whole world? Could we ever all be of one thought in, in these kinds of a, a, a way? I think not. Um, you know, uh, you, you say you've read uh, my years of magical thinking. Sure. And um, I, one of the points of that book was, whereas there's this idea that uh, humans have got various primitive ways of thinking, you know, magical thinking, doing silly things, dancing around and painting your faces. Then there's artistic thinking. If you if you do your magic for long enough, you become good at it, and then it's called art. You know, and <laughs> sure. if you do if you do your art for long enough, you do it with real authority, then it's called religion. And then, fortunately, we woke up a few centuries back and created science, and now we and that's a very sort of linear you know end of history type of version now we're there we can forget the early stuff yes now what i argued is actually all those phases are alive and well and in fact we tend to cycle round 
And one of the arguments I put for that in the book was um, that if we, if we, what's a static end point like science, and that's the end of it, end of development, it's actually uh, not very good for evolution. On the one of the reasons we're so evolutionary powerful is the way we have all these different ways of thinking. You move between them. The sort of churn is actually very healthy. Um, and I gave the example of um, you know religious thinking, where people sort of gather around a flag or a nation or a god and will give their lives for it. That, of course, has given humans tremendous power um, over other creatures. I know that there are other pack animals, you know, like wolves, but I don't know any um, creature other than the humans that would go and live in another culture for several years before blowing themselves up with an exploding vest. Sure. You know, it's an extraordinary, um, powerful thing. And then artistic you know the way people can be sort of motivated by a song or a marching tune or a flag or something um, and magical thinking that that idea that by sheer will i can overcome any obstacle those are very powerful things and they've got just as much evolutionary advantage as um uh you know rational thinking that was one of the arguments of people who say they're frightened of ai you know they argue that uh, humans have risen to the top of the food chain because of their intelligence. So if anything becomes more intelligent than us, more rational, then we're threatened by it. And I say, well, is it really true that it's our intelligence got us here? It might be that we had sex but more than the, um, than the uh, Neanderthals. <laughs> we outbred sure. them. Um, it might be this religious thing which hangs together. And I think some people have argued that actually has been very powerful in our evolution, in the way we can sort of gather around an abstraction. So, yeah, I sort of say, you know, it, I'm not denying the importance of intelligence, but the idea that it's a sort of final end point. Um, and always, and I gave the example of the movies in the 50s. There was a, a phase of science fiction movies, you know, where beings came from outer space they were super intelligent they had the most amazing weapons and of course to make a good movie we defeated them in the end sure it always was something like you know professor how was it we were able to defeat them well they had every advantage they had the intelligence they had the weapons but they just didn't understand the sheer dogged um, nature of humans yeah. or, or the power <laughs> of human love or something in other words a sort of recognition that actually um, there is more to it and so I think that um, I understand the fear of an ideology because, of course, you've seen what happened with Nazism sure. in Germany and communism, Stalinism, I should call it really rather than still communism. But um, I think that that sort of churn thing is so innate in us. You know, if Hitler, say, had you know, won the war, um, there would have come a point when he would be a very old man, rather like the man in the high tower or high castle. Yes. Um, and I bet there would have been fights to get to the top and different factions, and things like that, and it would have crumbled. You know, it, it's, very, um, it's, it's very hard to maintain something forever in human society. So I, I can be worried about it in the short term, but if I think longer term, I don't think it's the end of humanity. You know, <laughs> something will, will happen. It'll it'll break up. Sure. It'll break into schism. Mm. Well, I, th I mean, I thought an interesting bridge from this exact topic would be when you reference, I mean, Hitler's an obvious example, but it's just such a hot button name. I'll, I'll skip mm. to another one. Napoleon, mm. Alexander the Great, these sorts of figures, you know, these characters yeah. who... I mean, I will say one of the problems with trying to know about these characters is they're such amazing characters to base like an epic poem on or to write a story mm. from their perspective as if they were always seeing the world in this, you know, higher sense or they had some incredible drive to do mm. something amazing. So you're already almost getting into the artistic world with that and these like romantic notions. Mm. I mean, we can't really know with a lot of them 
except for actually the more recent ones who left some writing behind, what they really were thinking or what their ideas were. You know, we can't know how how much yeah. of a cool character they were as the version compared to the one that's in our mind. But what I would ask is oh, this, yes. is oftentimes mm. these characters do seem in the things they've said to be actually obsessed with notions of destiny, uh, leaving a special legacy behind, uh, accomplishing things other people haven't accomplished. Like, this this sort of thing does seem to veer into the territory where some of them even, I mean, obviously with Hitler, it was literally the whole thing about the spirit of destiny and Alexander had all the things with the, the De- Oracle of Delphi and all these sorts of things that they seem to really flirt with, actually, the occult world, essentially, and the, I'd say the world of the imagination, as it were. So do you think, actually, that with people like that and with the ideologies that, that maybe prop them up or spring from them, uh, is there something magical going on there, whether they know it or not? I think there is, yes. Um, as you say, whether they know it or not. Uh, I, I gave you a thing about egregores in one of my videos, which people found interesting. And I, I said that I, I don't usually use words like that because they're jargon, you know, and sure. I have to do so much jargon for my writing and I try and avoid it. But um, it's an interesting idea of a sort of thought form that builds up. And I point out there's, there's two versions of it. One is that a group of people can get together and form an egregore. And um, you can see this happening like in a, a great pop concert or something. There's a marvelous example someone showed me of um, a group called Baby Metal. Um, and they, when they launched uh, their album called, oh, I can't remember what it was, but um, a few years back, they did this terrific concert on the day of um, the Fox Gods Day, which is the 1st of April. Okay. And if you see that with half a million people, I think it was, was it 50, I don't know, if, I think it was 50,000 people in a huge stadium, all giving this, this Fox God Mudra symbol with their hands while these people floated above them, um, you realize a, a tremendously powerful thought form is being built up. And, um, I think in that case, they were thinking religiously, you know, they chose the, the fox deity and that. But I think for a lot of people, they just think, oh, this is a new thing, you know, and they get a great feeling of joining in on this great thought form. Now, they, I just point out there is, of course, another version which says those thought forms are, are already out there. And what you're really doing is tapping into them. So, for instance, um, you could either start a religion based on a war god and create one or else you could say the war god is out there trying to get people to worship it and you know so there's two sort of versions of it but it amounts the same thing a bit like if people have seen same... the television show and obviously the great book by neil gaiman um american gods like this would obviously be a very good analogy if anyone knows the ah, reference. yes it was quite similar you know yes. the idea was these old gods had been forgotten and they wanted to re-inspire people to mm. follow them and yeah it was kind of like what you're saying here yeah that's interesting, yes, because one of the things that, um, it's, it's my theory really, is that um, uh, if a god gets denied and repressed, it's a bit like setting your pet dog or cat out into the wild, and they get a bit fierce. Sure. So um, sometimes, you know, when you sort of resurrect an old religion, to start with, they they are quite devilish because they're, they're like sort off. of snarling at you from the waist. Right. Yeah, they're pissed <laughs> off, you know. Okay. And, and so so it's sort of quite a, a daring but exciting thing to do. Sure. It's like um, so recapturing a wild wild beast, and then I think that um, you know worship actually tames gods. Um, they behave better up to a certain extent um, if people worship them. It's sort of forming a relationship with them. It's um. Yeah, I haven't really compared that with other people, but that's that's the way I see it sometimes. Okay. Um, w- one thing I want to ask you about is, right, I've noticed that a lot of people in the modern context, because, like, I mean, when I say modern, I'm sure my age, I just mean kind of from the 90s, the 80s onwards, like the time I've been mm. alive, basically, they've tried to take mm. what has become part of, I would say, academia elsewhere, like, postmodern ideas, deconstructionist ideas. And when they've tried to apply it to the world of magic, one of the areas that they immediately get interested in 
is, I mean, you'd call it like semiotics or they get interested in things like linguistics. Like what is the language element here? I mean, in mm. a sense, I applaud them because people before then, they would essentially, you were kind of grasping in the dark trying to even describe these things. Like how do you describe what we're doing right now where we're saying words that, yeah, you could write down, but we're not like the way our minds seem to be thinking them and interacting with them and the fact that they're actually related to our ideas which again what are even those are they pictures are they things that just exist separately it's all, it's such a tricky area that i kind of applaud the mm. idea of trying to nail these things a little bit or start to model them would probably be the better way to phrase it and i think obviously a classic example of this actually would be uh, one of my favorite comic book artists alan moore who is obviously an open occultist mm. in a lot of his modern mm. day work he directly will say things that are kind of his uh, his his epiphanies. Like he will basically say to him, mm. art and magic are the same thing. It's just that art mm. is. I mean, to to kind of refer to what you said earlier, art is kind of like the part of magic that people recognise. It's like it's elements of expression mm. or things that you've mixed your own life with the world and you've interacted with it in some way, and you can produce this effect where someone maybe experiences something similar to you or something unique to a normal just mm. day-to-day experience. And the other classic analogy he gives is that society has taken all the things that they know and like that work about magic, like advertising is the obvious example. If anyone knows yeah. anything, I mean, mm. you've done a lot of great work about this yourself, about mm. how if you were to approach a marketing campaign, you very well might go mm. and just figure out things like, right, I'm going to use Hermes, I'm going to use Green. I think I'm even remembering an exact example from maybe oh, yeah. this week or something. Yes. One, one of them you wrote. Yeah. So in, in this case... Yeah. Um, like this, this idea is something that has been explored a little bit. But what I want to ask you is this: from your own life experience, do you think that language itself really is um, something that has always existed? Like, here's the thing, Ramsey. I, I am just going to treat it like you are, like the oracle at the end of time. And if you can't answer these questions, mate, no one can. So, <laughs> and I know it's an enormous question to ask someone. Do you think language actually yeah. always existed as long as humans, whatever that means, existed? Like, is language somehow a function or some a, a process that a human being always goes through? Like, with, one of the things they tell us in the mainstream explanation of history is this notion that there almost wasn't mm. language for a while, that with humans were this kind of an ape, and we were moving between an ape and between whatever a human is now. And at some point, you know, people started to talk, maybe before they were just singing or making weird sounds. Like, do you, are you someone who thinks it developed? Do you think that this is somehow, I mean, in Alan Moore's case, he thinks that language essentially, because it's connected to the imagination, is kind of like, it's almost like a doorway into another realm, one that isn't obviously nuts and bolts and we can touch with our hands. It's, it's somehow we access it from our mind. So what do you think it's yeah. something, I mean, and then there's a final thing to throw in. It is kind of mm-hmm. um, bizarre that almost every ancient civilization that we have any record of always goes to great pains mm. to point out that language, especially their language, seems to come from the gods. Like they never seem to say mm. like that, you know, the gods did everything else, yeah. but leave that out for some reason. So what, what, what's your take on this? Yes, that's, gosh, it's such a big question. It is, I know. <laughs> One thing that sort of immediately comes to mind of, you know, the idea of a grimoire, um, that that word grimoire comes from the same root as grammar. Um, sure. So that language certainly in recent times has been very much associated with magic. Um, now, uh, I think that I, I, when I was writing an introduction to a book about runes, um, I said, uh, for some people, you know, what's so magical about an alphabet? You know, it's just a collection of letters, you know, um, where's the magic? And I said, if you think back, and this was me, just my imagination, imagine you go back in time to when we really were sort of animals. Um, uh, fighting another tribe or something, you know, um, throwing sticks and stones. And then one of the tribes makes noises and suddenly they start acting in unison, not just individuals bashing away. Um, Now, this, of course, applies to some animals like wolves and that. Basically, how weird it would seem if you didn't know about language the people could make yelping sounds and then suddenly could sort of line up and attack all at once. You know, sure. How do they do that? Is it telepathy or something? So that would seem very powerful. Um, then I said, go ahead to the time when you've never heard of written language 
and imagine a runner who has been sent with a message from one king to another country and he's been given this clay tablet with with marks on it and said this is very precious you must hand it to the king in the other country and you run and run and run for days you know and then it's handed over and the person looks at this sample of, of um clay and then he starts saying well how well how bad is the war in sparta or something you know in other words he knows things which can't possibly have got there because you were the fastest runner on the land and you just, you just arrived. Sure. How does this piece of clay speak to him? Now, that would seem magical, wouldn't it? Um, you know, here is a piece of clay that actually carries messages and speaks to him. So I said that um, just to say, oh, it's just an alphabet, you know, where's the magic, is not realistic. If you really look back at how this must have crept into human civilization it must have seemed absolutely awesome at first um and uh that was a long ago but even something like um the change which uh, gutenberg inventing the printing press sure. when you think how profoundly it's changed our lives although we no longer um and modern people would say well that isn't magic but it is actually magical if you see what I mean, they explain it away, but it's it. So, um, and perhaps the internet, you know, um, language uh, has done extraordinary things. It's just in our modern rationalist way. Too good to explain it away, yeah. We can talk. Yes, we explain it away rather than saying, isn't that awesome, you know, and, and really. Um, uh, just one other thing was that idea I had of... Um, magical thinking beginning when a, a little toddler who can't speak notices that some things happen absolutely regularly and i give the example of he pushes a spoon to the edge of the table and it falls down sure. every time that's um that's uh, the beginnings of science he's learning he doesn't understand cause and effect yet but he's looking for things that are absolutely regular and and you can predict almost and then the mother comes and picks it up but she doesn't always do it the same. And sometimes she's angry and she doesn't pick it up. Um, so there's a difference there. And he resolves it by sort of thinking, hey, what if there's another me inside that mother? Um, that might explain, you know, because I can be bullshit at times. It's a sort of um, Theory beginnings of, mind, right? of magical yeah. thinking. Yes, you put your mind out into the world. You know, you could talk to a tree. Why not? Um, you know, you just think of it as being a living thing. Okay, it doesn't necessarily understand your language, but you can talk to it and pat it. Um, uh, and I say that there's really a sort of branch there because either you go down the line of everything is mechanical, therefore mother must be mechanical too, but just more complicated. Sure. I must learn how to press it buttons and manipulator or else you go down a line of saying well everything's alive you know um treat everything with respect love it <laughs> or hate it whatever you know so um in that way the beginnings of magic i see is pre-verbal um but what what language does it begins to connect you up your mind up to other people's minds and that really is moving more towards religion and science sure. you know, because those are the things which are shared ideas um, uh, not the individual so much I was thinking of that example of you know if a scientist um, say uh, drank some herb and it, is, it cured his AIDS instantly that would be amazing but it wouldn't be accepted unless everyone else who tried it or the other scientists sure. got the same result. Um, it it only becomes valid if we do it. If no one else manages to drink that herb and be cured, then they say, well, that was just a coincidence. But if you go to something artistic like a sport, you know, playing golf, if I pick up a club for the first time and go thwack and get a hole in one, um, the fact that no one else can pick up that club and get a hole in one makes my achievement even greater. Sure. Um, it doesn't, um, if everyone did it, it's a lesser achievement. So it's like a sort of opposite there, which I think is very interesting. You know, that um, uh, 
science de- is experiment is negated unless everyone else can do it or most people can do it whereas for something artistic or um, magical uh, if you manage to achieve something no one else can do it's an achievement <laughs> sure it's a, i mean along these yeah. lines actually i think i think here's an angle you could you could use in your work mate which is that anyone who doesn't know anything about the field of the occult and imagines it's just you know in the modern day it's just for people who are fanciful or that's soft in the head or i mean the obvious thing they would say mm. is it for children right it's for kids is you should just say yeah it is you, you've nailed yeah it. that's right let's become like kids because if, like if i think of your book mm. how to see how to see fairies it's basically mm. what you're describing here. It's about getting yourself back to that kind of a state where you're even open to yes. the idea that a tree's alive in a way that, you know, the biologist mm. wouldn't tell you it is. And if you you have to essentially, yeah. I mean, this is an element I often tell people about this, which is why you can't use scientific method if you want to explore this area, is even the books, and obviously Alistair Crowley was a big proponent of this, that tell you, you know, here's what you do, mm. like have no expectations, mm. just do these things, the results will follow. The problem is the person will do it so half-heartedly and so immediately. Like, they'll mm. just take the book and do that on day one, get no result, and go, uh, well, this doesn't work yes. at all, which, you know, would be the equivalent, I guess, to mm. having all the pieces to a radio and just throwing it together, not really mm. even paying that much attention and go, well, I, I couldn't <laughs> pick up anyone on the radio, so there's, no, there's nobody talking on radios. It's, it's nonsense. So, I mean, essentially, mm. in some ways, we're having to go... It's, it's a positive that we can go back to this sort of childlike state to, to re-experience the world. Mm. Yes, because... It's both the innocence of it, you know, being open to the possibility. Um, I'm open to the possibility. I'm not saying this tree has got a soul and can hear what I'm saying, but I'm open to the possibility it might somehow receive my love. And um, that now that sort of childlike, um, that openness. um, But the other thing is that um, uh, a child will give it a go. Um, as you say, some people their magic they do it sort of half-heartedly, or um, they don't really believe it. They want to tr- prove trying it, it out, work, right? Like yeah, exactly. Yes, that's it. Yeah, there's that thing. Um, one of the one of my videos, I think I said magical is a problematic word, um, and what it was was I was reading a book about the sort of uh, religion and the magic and science, and um, it spoke rather scornfully about, um, uh, and I know, 1600s or something. People were stealing holy water from a church because they thought it had magical, in inverted commas, powers to heal. Sure. In other words, they thought, steal the holy water, give it to someone who's ill, and they'll get better. Now, I thought about that, and I thought, well, that really isn't magical. That is pseudoscience or bad science sure because anyone who looks at magic in any depth you know reads or down fortune or anything like that you soon learn it's a lot about discipline and practice and getting into a certain frame of mind yes now the idea that you could just take holy water and you've stolen it for god's sake it's no longer holy if you like <laughs> exactly you sure it. it's not <laughs> against give it to someone yeah. to get better that's the way science works you know steal an aspirin tablet and give it to someone who'll cure his headache yeah sure. you, know, um, you don't have to sort of um chant anything or anything you know so it's, it's funny people use that term magical oh they think it'll heal them magically when really they're talking about <laughs> bad science rather than magically um because uh you know for magic you actually have to get into it mentally um uh give something to it you know give a give a belief or give a an effort um it's um yeah it's okay one thing mm. um along these uh, one 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 area i found very very interesting the last maybe five years i've gotten really interested in this area is I, i'll just as an, an aside in my work i mean i work literally in the field where we cover tournaments in video games and you know I've always essentially had some sort of understanding 
that you have to imagine and you have to aspire to something that does not yet exist. Otherwise, it never will. Like, if you want to make that just yeah. what we're doing, we're just watching people play a video game, someone wins in the video mm -hmm. game because he's slightly better than the other guy, that becomes, as I'm even describing it, the most mundane thing ever. But the analogy I always give people, because mm -hmm. it's a great way to sell it to the public, is, well... I mean, it's childish, right? You wouldn't, you'd think, well, who would waste their life following that? Who would, who would, who would cry over the guy who lost the game? And then the obvious analogy is sports, right? I mean, people literally mm. run around, they kick a leather football into a net, you're <laughs> on, in tears on the floor, or you're experiencing yeah. the greatest ecstasy of your life. Like, we can all see that. We're mm. all, we all want, you have to want the thing to be amazing. You have to want the star player to mm. be, you know, some godlike Titanic mm. figure that f walks the earth and battles the other guy. You have to want <laughs> it to some degree. So one area that I found very mm. interesting in, uh, like reading areas is all these symbolic interpretations of, I mean, the Bible is obviously a classic one if you're in the Western tradition, but all the great texts, you know, the idea that whereas some people would interpret it literally, it's the easiest way to dismiss the Bible, obviously, because it mm. disagrees with modern mm. scientific conclusions. But then what happens is mm. people start to reclaim it. And to the person who wouldn't ever believe in magic, they go, no, no, it's not that. It's like art. You know, what they were trying to say mm. was they were using metaphor yeah. here. They never really meant this. And this is essentially the, the yeah. where I wanted to ask you about. This is my dilemma, is that in mm. the same way as uh, I can force these great texts through the literal scientific paradigm and see that a lot of it doesn't hold up, mm. when I force it through the mm. art paradigm, a lot of it starts to become really interesting in a way it wasn't before. Like suddenly, mm. guess what? Cain and Abel isn't just about some capricious god who was sort of like doing some bizarre popularity contest between two people. It's maybe about, you know, your relationship to your brother or something. It's, it's got a lot of, it's a lot, it's a lot yeah. in there that you can kind of bring yourself. But then this is where my dilemma yeah. comes is that also though, is a clever way to strip it of any kind of magical components. Like I'm still saying it's just an idea and essentially wink, wink ideas are just really, they're really sort of like cool things, aren't they? But they're not real. They're also not real. Mm. These are just, you know, it's mm. an idea. Wink, wink. We all know an mm. idea is an idea. It's just fun, right? So essentially, mm. all the religious experiences people have, all of those aspects of yearning that people have in their life, they're not going to get that through my symbolic interpretation. So what I want to sort of mm. ask is, without invoking dreaded terms like real, not real, true, false, mm. because we're going to be lost if we, if we try to bring those into a discussion mm. like this, it seems like either you can make all these levels work or they all exist simultaneously or something like that. Like it's like none of them seem to be totally true or false and none of them seem to be, none of them as, as mm -hmm. none of them seem to be totally true or false. It's, it feels like if you investigate all these areas, you can get something out of it, maybe something different. So what do you think of this whole angle of, because obviously that's the way a lot yeah. of the modern people, even if they give you a mm. chance in the occult world, they're just going to interpret it symbolically. Mm. Yes. I, um, I think I was trying to address something like that, again, in the book, My Years of Magical Thinking, where I said that um, we are in a world of experience. There's this wonderful platonic idea that compares that to people in a cave looking at shadows on the wall sure. of a cave. And they think that's all there is. Um, to make a more modern analogy, they're in a cinema and they're on the screen as all these things happening. And they think this is real life. Sure. Whereas the Platonist says, turn around, it's just shadows being cast because of light coming in through the cave. And this is the truth. Here is the projector. Here's the film going through it. This is what's real. The other is just a fantasy. Now, that's a very powerful idea. And it, can, it works in religious terms. You know, this is world is an illusion created by God, by the devil or by God, you know, and um, sure. uh, it's not real. And when we die, we'll be back in reality. Or else the scientific version, which says, um, yeah, yeah, you, you thought you saw a fairy, but you know, basically the brain made a mistake, you know, and we know the truth. We know the real world is things happening inside your brain, you know. So they're both saying, um, uh, your experience, however wonderful and magical it is, isn't actually real, whereas we know the real world. And so that does is sort of puts above our, our experience a truth layer, you know, a, a higher layer rather than sort of in like information theory. I've got sure. higher layer, which is the truth layer. Now, the thing is that um, as a magician, 
you say, well, actually, there's two truths there you can choose from. Either the Bible version, you know, this is God, or the science version. Which one do you like best? And you could think of some other ones, too. You know, how about um, this world was created by the devil to tempt us, or this world was created by God to test us? You, know, um, you realize that there's a whole lot of different possibilities in that truth layer. And so I said, what magic does is like puts another layer above that you might call the games layer, which says find the so-called truth which works best for you and use it um you know um if you've got a dilemma you don't know what's happening and you want some advice well go to the truth which says that the um tarot pack is an ancient wisdom system sure. coming back from time immemorial go into that truth model and try it and you should get good results, you know. And if you, if you don't, or try something else. Go to the Yi King. This is the secret of the universe. You know? go, go, or the astrology or something. So um, uh, I recognize there are all these different um, conflicting versions. And you can spend your life wondering which is the real <clears throat> one. Or else, to me, magic is a lot about saying, well, hang on, I'm going to find the one that works best for me. And it may not be the same one all the time, you know. Um, uh, if I suddenly got um, bad cancer, I think I would go to the, um, the, the normal medicine, you know, straight medicine, um, truth layer to get it cut out. Um, I don't know, I mean, but that's my first thought. Sure. Whereas if I've got a sort of... Um, uh, I know, sort of nagging little pains, this, that, and the other. I might prefer to go to a Chinese medicine or something like that. You know, in other words, different things are better for different things. I can and, appreciate um, also how there's so a little bit that, of cynicism yeah. shaded in there, Ramsey. Like you would try that for the really extreme one. You'd just trust that yes. <laughs> whatever the current yeah. model works. But, you know, you don't mind taking a flyer on something very mild, like an itch or something, yes. you know. And again, you see, that, that again is good evolution because... Um, you know, it's like saying, should sheep all follow the ram or should they wander around a bit on their own? Now, if they wander around a bit of their own, then they're, as a flock, they're in more danger. But um, if the ram makes a, chooses a bad path, the few that wandered around and found better grass actually um, uh, are good for the flock. You know, they're finding new ways. Sure. And so um, uh, the... The best thing, I said, is to wander around and explore when things are safe. But if things get dangerous, it's best to stick together, you know, and find a, a common thing. So if I'm just um, fairly healthy and just got a few nagging pains, things like that, then alternative medicine, experimenting is a great thing to do. But if something really severe um, attacks me, it's very natural um, evolutionary <laughs> resource to um uh, evolutionary strategy to go with what the herd does sure. because um you're sticking together so yeah people can laugh at that but i think it makes a lot of sense you know it's um you're doing the best thing for the best conditions i think actually i have a good analogy i could draw to that especially that's i mean listen in this kind of a conversation on the one hand we're hopefully it's being listened to by people who do care about hermeticism these kinds of areas but you know there's also the person who's going to stumble onto it and obviously they're just going to hear all the names you mentioned and think well i have no idea what they're talking about mm. and you hope they're just hooked by it so one thing i would say is, is a secular example they could actually probably appreciate mm. is um since in that example there one of the things i thought was really kind of useful about that a a analogy was the idea that neither set of sheep is correct. Like the sheep that only goes away mm. on its own, I can definitely relate to that mm. myself. You might chart new mm. ground. You might even survive when the rest of them get killed. Maybe maybe that to you, with yeah. your yeah. narrow field of experience, would be like, I did the right thing. Meanwhile, when the guy mm. who walks away on his own gets killed and picked off very easily himself, but the rest of the herd stay together somewhere and don't get killed by a wolf or whatever, they're going to think they were right in that mm. scenario. And I think the real th yeah. key thing here is neither is yeah. correct. So my analogy would be this. Mm. I I'm sure you've probably heard this name. I don't know if you know the person, but there's a person called Jordan Peterson who became very famous the last few years. It's kind of... Um, someone who, I mean, he's a clinical psychologist from Canada who has done a lot of work with symbolic interpretation of texts like the Bible. And then he became quite famous in the political oh. world because he tried to kind of address the dangers of ideology and these sorts of things. It's one of those n names where, unfortunately, 
it carries with it like it's a very hot button name. People react very harshly. So mm. I'm I'm just referencing him because this oh, is a concept yeah. I heard him bring up, which I thought applied to this very well, which is he explained how when you go into the game of politics, obviously in the most um, famous level, people literally, it's a form of tribalism. They pick their side. They even have, a, I mean, we, we've got to be loving it if we're coming from the occult world. They're even picking colors, Ramsey, and symbols that represent <laughs> their side in American politics. Like, yeah. they, they, they don't even realize what they do in this sense. You know, it's so obviously, mm. it's got the theater yeah. of magical ritual involved with it and being part of that tribe. So when people go into that mm. world, as a natural function of the war of I'm on this side and you're on the other side, you have to make the other side wrong, the enemy, your side, the good side, mm. the right side. Yeah. You, you do these very um, very stark contrasts. But the point that Jordan Peterson made was this. It's that no matter where you are on the political spectrum, we actually need there to never be one side that wins. We need essentially the creative mm. tension between the sides because what we need, I mean, yes, th this yes. is something I, you could obviously appreciate with the book you wrote, The, the Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Uh, and The Funny, was it? Was it Ugly? Mm. What was the third one? Was it Funny was the third I mean, one? Yeah, good, The Bad, The Funny, yeah. yeah. There we yeah, go. I'm going to mix it with yes. the movie. Yeah, funny. You, can, you can obviously mm. appreciate this because, I mean, it's even it's it's linked even with the idea of synthesis, right? So in this scenario, what he described mm. it as was if you came from something of, again, we're going to use very broad terms, a left-wing background, the premise is supposed to be mm. you care more about the average person, you want fairness as much as you can you want the weak to be taken care of then the logic would go the person who's on the right wing is more about like protect the things that are here conserve the things that are valuable from the past don't just throw them away in a loose manner you know there's these there's, there's the notion is there's positives and negatives to both sides but if we don't have both mm. then we will inevitably go towards the extremes of both sides and i would hope at this point in time the lessons of history, even in the last few centuries, have taught us that the extremes on either end is where we get into trouble. That's where we have the really bad yeah. regimes and mm. ways of life and things that just seemingly cannot cannot mm. make, continue. So essentially, again, neither is right, neither is is wrong, which is not to say yeah. they're all the same and they're clearly not. In fact, that's in fact what I'm saying is that they're not the same. That's why we need essentially a spectrum to mm. exist and we need the interplay like that interplay yes. between them seems to be really the mm. essence even though that's what as far as i can tell almost everyone in the political game is almost in denial of yeah yes i mean it takes us back to our, our more or less opening topic which was you know if um all other ways of thinking are finished and science is the only you know rational is, is the only answer it actually we are stultifying ourselves yeah we're going into a uh, into a um a cul-de-sac you know um if that's all there is um and the same thing with um these contrasting ideas if the world went totally left wing and there wasn't any opposition um yeah it wouldn't work would it uh it might be there might be a sort of very happy socialist phase for about one generation and then the then you know what happens you get a next generation says this is boring and they start putting sure. swastikas on their heads and um sort of shaving I mean, their heads and you think know, of the punks it, yeah that, it, that was kind of that kind of a response yeah, right that's it yes yeah the punks absolutely that response to i mean i love the hippie thing i was all for it and then these sure. people came along and said boring old farts you know? <laughs> <Of course. laughs> it's quite hurtful yeah <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think that, um, it's it's that same thing. That it's, it's the churn in humanity which has actually given us a great advantage. You know, made us the top of the food chain. The fact that we're restless, we keep we keep doing different things, which means we make a hell of a lot of mistakes. But it also means that we've got tremendous adaptability. Um, you know, if um, if beings to space with superior technology and try to tame us uh they would have a hell of a time because sure. we can be magic we can be religious we can be artistic you know if they were using pure rationalism to try and pin us down it would drive them crazy it's um I mean, I think it seems also, uh, touching on a very similar theme that you're talking about now, it also seems as though, I like that if we draw back to the analogy of the baby and, and kind of the pre 
uh, linguistic pre-theory of mind, like explorations of the world, like seeing how they interact with the world. It's not just them. They're not just an observer. You know, they have an effect and then they start to figure out there's other beings in this world. And that, Like what I found quite interesting about that is there's another thing that seems to me like, I mean, I dread to use the word epiphany because it just, it sounds sort of sort of grand rising, but I feel like that's an epiphany I've also had in life, which is that it's not that these mm. ideas have more efficacy than each other. It's almost like the idea is most relevant based on who you are at the time and sometimes even maybe literally where you are in your life. So, for example, like, I think mm. two very obvious ones would be there's a very famous quote people probably know that goes along the lines of, you know, if you're a young man and you're not a liberal, then you have no heart because the idea is like, how could you not, you know, feel for the people yeah. of the world? Think of Buddha. Mm. I mean, that's an obvious example, right? How could you not yeah. look at all the poor people and say, yeah. why haven't these guys got a break? And, you know, whether you know what to do with it, that's irrelevant. You just have that impulse. And then <laughs> and then later mm. in life, this, the quote goes, but if you remain a, a liberal when you're old, man, you have no brain because the idea is, well, you know, one thing <laughs> you have to learn yes. as a human, yeah. right, is guess what? everyone else before you wasn't an idiot and you didn't just turn up with all the great ideas. And guess what? A lot of the people who made those people poor and in our fucked up society, they probably had some great intentions. Mm. They probably even came from your worldview. That's why they started trying to enact change. Mm. But you know what? There are certain things that are just the way they are or, or that we have to sometimes do. Sometimes we have to be harsh. Let's face it. Like we can't always be lovely and, yeah. and super nice to everyone. Otherwise you give up other certain things. So and then the other analogy I would give, it's a very similar topic to that, would be, and I, this is another thing that I've been, has really been blowing my mind the last few years is, I was one of those people who read themselves into the rational materialist worldview, and I thought, yeah, I've nailed it, here we go, this is the top level of human thinking, all mm. the rest of the stuff was nonsense before it. And then as I've started to go into the symbolic and the artistic and the occult elements of, of life, and especially once I've connected it with human history where there was this alternate history I didn't know was going on, and it certainly wasn't just idiots and people who washer mm. women doing these ideas. Like some of these are some of the greatest thinkers of all time have been interested in these mm. topics. One of the things yeah. I discovered was that great CS, I think, I can't remember if it's a CS Lewis quote or someone else. It's a quote that goes along the lines of like the first gulp of the drink of natural science, which for anyone who doesn't know is kind of like a, cle it's a clever way to mm. <laughs> make it sound like you're approaching the mm. occult in a scientific manner. It's not really supposed to be like science in the strict biological mm. sense. When he said, when you, when you take the first sip of uh, the, the drink of natural science, you will become an atheist because the idea is, you know, some of your epiphanies will make you realize, well, there isn't oh, yeah. just one thing, there isn't one God, there's, you know, and it's very obvious then to just go, right, that's it, I've figured it out. But then the idea was at the bottom of the glass, once you keep drinking, you find, I mean, they use the dreaded word God there, but you, they find the mystery there. Mm. You, you return back to the yeah, mystery yeah, yeah. and suddenly everything's re-enchanted. Mm. So, have you found this yeah. in your own life? I mean, you're obviously someone who's explored a lot of ideas. It almost seems like that's your, that's kind of like your hobby, right? You just mm. like to get new ideas, play with <laughs> yes, them, see yeah. if you can make them work. Yeah. And then, I mean, it's a Crowley-esque thing. And then in the same way as he was trying to, mm. you know, invoke the gods of like a, a rolled up piece of paper from a dustbin, you move on to the next mm. thing and go, let's see if I mm. can enchant this. What, what would you say about this topic? Well, uh, I am by nature an explorer. <laughs> <laughs> so that I'm always trying something else. So if I if I find I'm believing too much in something, I think, well, what if it isn't true, you know, or what if it isn't the best way of doing it, or something. So I I I do think I I probably explore around more than most. But I when you were saying that about you know the um, when you're young, um, uh, you you'll be a liberal. Otherwise, you've got no heart. When you're old, um, you'll be conservative otherwise you should sure. rain um i i feel like adjusting it slightly um to say when you're young you're liberal or you've got no heart when you're middle-aged um uh, you'll be conservative um because you've got your head okay um but when you're in old age two things can happen when you get very old either you can fossilize or you can get become younger again um in your thinking and and your you know, all the things you're so sure of as middle age, you know, well, you can't just let people do this. You know, you've got to have in a public end, you've got to have um, uh, uh, competition. You've got to have this, that, and the other. When you get a bit older, you say, well, I used to think that I'm not, not so sure now, you know. <laughs> I know some quite nice people who, who aren't competitive. It's sort sure. of um, quite a lot. It's the oldest generation 
either some of them fossilize, but others um, get a more relaxed, perhaps rather Buddhist sort of view of the world, you know. Well, we've seen everything, done everything, you know, um, uh, we, we can accept it all. And um, it, it's funny, sometimes, you know, when you have um, like a family, uh, the children, uh, in a way, get on better with the grandparents than they do with the parents. The parents are the people who give them the structure and they've got to rebel against. And then this granddad who sort of, you know, takes it a bit easy and says, well, you know, your father was just like that. Don't worry. Sure. You know? <laughs> it's, um, so, so there is that side of it, too, that... Um, uh, you know that um it isn't the end of the road that conservatism i think that comes it, it can still evolve into something else i don't know if that's answered your question really uh yeah it answers part of it by the way one thing i liked about that was like yeah. that that would be a brilliant chapter in a book right there ramsey reinterprets great political <laughs> philosophies of things and you just <laughs> add your own because obviously you could come from the magical bent like you did there and try and add a third element because as the book that we referenced earlier mm. the good bad and funny shows it's it's not until you put in the third element that you actually start to realise even certain things about the relationship of the original two elements. Uh, the the other part that was I yes. guess at the beginning of my my long preamble was the idea that to me at least it felt like it's not that the one idea was more true or false than the other. It's that I I I, I hate to use the word needed, but I'll just use it for the sake of of function here. It's almost like I needed to experience each of these different worldviews, ideologies, whatever, yes. different times in my life. And I'm yeah. not even sure that there was necessarily an order mm. to it, but that it, it was almost like each was necessary or had, had value, let's say, a, a different period in my yeah. life. And obviously, I'm very mm. interested to see what happened when I get older in that sense, if I'll, if I'll mm. continue. Yeah. yeah, I think it was in Thunder Squeak where I sort of suggested, you know, if you feel very, very... Um, opposed to something, um, join it. Now, obviously, that you know, there's a limit to what you can do. <laughs> of course, yes. If say, yeah. um, <laughs> if say you you think that um, uh, young hippies um, trying to live close to nature and everything is absolutely disgusting, um, join them. Um, then either you'll discover that you were wrong, and it's actually a decay way of life. Or else you may discover that you were right, and you'll go back and really knowing what you're talking about. You know, it's um, it's so. I I remember um, uh, being very surprised as someone who was a a rabid communist, but he always bought the Financial Times. He says, "Well, you know, know your enemy or whatever." Um, it's <laughs> sure. a damn good newspaper anyway. So, I like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that. Um, uh, there's an element of truth in that, you know. Um, uh, I, I sometimes feel when two people are absolutely, you know, I've not not often been in this position, but if, say, I had to mediate between two extremes, let's say it was a communist and a capitalist you know, about to kill each other, and I um, am told, um, what I feel I'd like to do is to say to the communist, um, I want to give you. I want you to give me a really good argument for the benefits of capitalism, and um, to say to the capitalists, I want you to give me a really good argument for why capitalism might not be good for society. Um, and I said, look, you've got to do this well, because the first thing they'll do is, oh, I'm going to give a sort of um, a sly, jokey pretend argument for capitalism and make yeah, it sound snarky, silly sure i say yeah yeah that's it i say no you haven't argued well um so you know i can't count your opinion but if each gave a really good argument as best they could for the other i'd feel that they would begin with such a a shared understanding they might actually get somewhere in the in the debate you know that um unless you can really understand um how capitalism can work to um uh inspire people to try hard and be productive and um and to, i use this analogy of poachers and farmers you know um, you could say both poachers and farmers exploit the land in different ways the poacher will 
grab whatever he can get off the land and go, um, leaving it poorer. Whereas the farmer, if he's a good farmer, knows that he actually has to give something back to the land. Sure. And so capitalism at its best acts like that. You know, you, um, uh, they may be exploiting the workers in a certain area, but if they're good capitalists, they know that they will get more out of them if they feed them well and educate them because sure. then they're they're higher level workers you know so that's like a farmer putting fertilizer on the land and sort of um uh, strengthening it whereas a poacher um would just say i'm going to get all i can out of these people until they're dead um now of course the limit of that thing um is that you can get who just says i'm going to rape this land get everything i can out of it and then go and leave it and you can get a good poacher who is a poacher but says i know that i've got to um keep the animals living otherwise i'm going to lose my sure. um, livelihood in the long run so it's not absolutely those two examples are quite useful that um uh you can see how both things can work if there's that balance in them um but they could both be utterly exploitive uh, if there isn't that balance. Sure. I suppose we're back to, you know, talking about these opposing views that um, uh, really the best is to have both possibilities there um, and uh, hope that it doesn't end up with a, a, a war and no point to it, you know, that actually uh, each can learn something from the other. And the swinging of the pen we have a good part of that. You know, people go too far one way and then it swings back. I remember an interesting thing about economics. They said when people are very comfortable, um, like in the 50s, late 50s in England, the 60s, they tend to go left wing. Um, they're happy to, um, you know, help poor people. And they say, yes, we accept taxes. They're needed in order sure. to keep people, off the, you know, people on the dole going like that. When people get frightened, they go very right wing. Um, Oh, lock them up. Um, you know, uh, oh, we can't have these scroungers on the dole and things like that. And he said, in a way, that's just the wrong way around because um, when things are economically very bad, it's actually the. Give a poor man a hundred pounds and he'll immediately spend it. Um, give the money to the rich people. And they just put it into some fund or, you know, um, insurance or something. And um, it, it won't go into the economy. So he said, you know, when people are feeling insecure financially, that's when you should be thinking left wing and um, spreading the money down to the roots of society where it will get into the economy. Um, and when the times are comfortable, then you can afford to have um, people getting, you know, rich people getting richer and all that because everyone's sure. fairly well off. I thought that was an interesting, I hadn't occurred to me, I heard economists saying that. Um, I think it's very true. It's like, yeah, again, it's the, it's the balancing thing. You know, you want a bit of the opposite, um, and you're going to extreme one way or the other. True. The best man is a bit of the opposite. I mean, the um, the obvious analogy that that immediately conjures to mind is of the yin yang single, right? The idea that there's a little yes, bit of yes. the opposite. In, in in the like mm. that you have to ha the, the premise is that if it was really just that there's two sides and you have to balance them it would just be black and white wouldn't it like that, that's it that's yeah, actually that's, by the way i think another yeah. great example of a symbol that you can interpret a million ways and depending on how much mm. you put into it all of them can have an efficacy for you in that moment yes yeah yeah such a profound symbol, yin yang um I can't remember the proper name for it, but uh, yeah. And um, one time I was talking about the binary model of good and evil, and I used that example. So I said, it's very um, sort of lined up. Um, something is ultimate evil and something else is good. And I think, of, um, you know, for my generation, the most evil thing you can think of just about was um, Nazism. Of course. Um, so that is totally black, totally evil. But if it was totally evil, people wouldn't have let it happen. 
you know, if Hitler had said, <coughs> I've got this wonderful um, new movement that's going to let sadists uh, do everything they like and we're going to go to war and <laughs> sure. we're going to kill a million Jews, I don't think he would have had a lot of votes. You know, um, what he said is that um, Germany needs a new spirit. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're getting run down and we're, we're ashamed. And what we need is new hope, new this, that, and the other. Um, he presented it as something glowing and wonderful. And that's the, it got going. And, um, you know, then the bad side began to show. But uh, and, and signs of it, obviously, at the beginning, you know, the world is built in and things like that. But the, the idea that um, people would have allowed something which was absolutely, obviously black is an open suspicion. Yeah, I, I'm not keen on Donald Trump, but he said make America great, and I can see the sort of the appeal in that, you know, even though it didn't work for me. Um, it's um, uh, it's it's the element of good in a bad thing which makes it so seductive. You know, that's what it's like. I'm putting sugar on the coating of it. You know, it's, uh, sure. coating it with sugar. It's um, uh, yeah. So I mean, that yin yang symbol I think is is, is amazing. You know, where you think it's pure white, there's a dot of black in there. Where you think it's purely black, there's a dot of white in there. And understanding that makes it much easier to handle this this dilemma of good versus evil. Um, you can be much more fine in, um, in your analysis of it. Actually, that makes me think... On the one hand, there is something very comforting about that when you realise that beyond, I would say, people who tend to be turn out to be very infantile and they don't seem to get very far in the world, they don't really seem to be large groups of people who, as, as you allude to, if you said to them, hey, everyone, we're all going to be evil, being evil's the best, and let's all be evil and ruin everything good. Like, you won't get people to sign up to that. Mm. So on the one hand, that is actually quite mm. a satisfying angle. Like, you know, even the worst things in history mm. obviously were done with noble intentions. Mm. At least they were dressed that way for the normal person, you know, not, maybe not, maybe some of the leadership yeah. were wise, maybe they had their own yes. quirks. But then the other hand, mm. that also could be a very scary thing because as you, as you point out, it's very easy potentially for someone to tap into what are the greatest intentions in us and direct or channel us mm. in ways that maybe if we don't put a lot of thought into, the outcome is what we could call evil. Again, obviously, evil, very loaded term in this yeah. sense. So I think on, yeah. on the one hand, it comforts me and mm. also scares me more. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yes. It's, um, I suppose it's, well, it's easy to say it's human nature, isn't it? It's sort of, it's part of us. And it's good to be aware of us, of that, in like in this conversation. You know, um, you can slip onto one side or the other but if you are aware of these tendencies think about them from time to time uh, you're better able it's like the balance of walking across a narrow bridge you know um, you uh, you know that either way you fall that's in the middle better um, uh, yeah, I think it's understanding helps in dilemmas like that. You, you, think I, yeah, if you, you, <laughs> I think even if you end up dead, you'll be wiser and dead rather than stupider you, and dead. Sure, <laughs> that is true. Um, one thing I thought is a very interesting topic I'd love to get your mm. take on is... Another thing about the modern day and the scientific way of thinking, which does seem with a lot of people to push them into this binary of like true or false, like it's right or wrong, you know, this, mm. this angle yeah. um, is, I feel like mm. an area it, that people will really miss out on experience in life is, I, I mean, I love that great mm. quote by Picasso that everyone must have heard where it's like, art is the lie that makes us realize the truth. 
Like that, that's just a, oh, a brilliant, yeah, it's, a brilliant it's, way of you know giving someone a key to the artistic world. If mm. instead they were like, well, I disagree with that, or yeah. I don't think that. And the reason why I like that, especially mm. if you're someone in the occult world, is you can get caught in all kinds of rabbit holes if you think that there was a great guru who everything they said was right or everything they said was wrong, and you're that's how you're interpreting the world. Because one of the mm. funniest things I've found actually is that when I think of some of the great occult figures of of history classic examples would be like Gurdjieff. I would even say in the modern day, someone who doesn't get lumped in with that area, but I think they should be, is that famous guru who went from in, uh, India to Oregon, the guy called Osho. Now, here's what's funny. I watched that document. There was a documentary recently about Osho that was on, um, I think it might even have been on like one of these streaming platforms, oh, yes. where they look into all well, the that's crazy Rajneesh, things. Rajneesh, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, Rajneesh. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the most interesting thing yes, to me yes, was this, Ramsey. Yes. When I watched the documentary, I mean, because I'm coming from this worldview, mm. I could see positives to the things that he was trying to do. But I could also see if you were an outsider, the nightmarish mm. reality that he was manifesting. But even mm. though at the yeah. end, people's yes. conclusion at the end of this documentary would be, well, he was probably a con man and you know, he wanted all those Rolls Royces, because that was the famous thing, if you remember, he had like the 90 Rolls Royce or whatever. Mm. You know, he wanted the Rolls Royces yes. or he maybe, yes. you know, like any guru, he wanted to get into people's orifices and their bot wallets and, and everything else that we, unfortunately goes along with mm. the guru game. Mm. Uh, but the thing that I found interesting is, mm. even though I know these things and I know what happened, when I read some of his quotes, I still find them very profound. I actually think some of his mm. the things he said were yes. amazing. Like oh, he has yes. some great quotes. So what that, to me, I don't mm. have to get caught up in, was he right, was he wrong? It's more like, even if you think some elements of his life were a lie, some of them, Somehow you can still, mm. I mean, they tap into something from that. What, what do you think on this topic? Because mm. I feel like yes. in the history of, of occult thinking, people do mm. concentrate too much on the finger as opposed to the moon to use the old <laughs> the old sort of Zen yes. Quan, yes. you know. What do you think about this yeah. topic? Mm. I was comparing um, Crowley's idea of the three aeons, where you had the aeon of Isis, the aeon of Osiris, and the aeon of Horus, which he was announcing as a new aeon. And I compared it um, to stages of growing up. And um, this was because for the Abramelin, I had to, you know, one of the things you've got to do is read through the Bible from beginning to end. Now, I was very much aware of this transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, which Crowley relates to the transition from the end of Isis to the end of Osiris. Because in the Old Testament, rules are laid down in do this, don't do that. Um, very strict rules, you know, um, things you can eat together, things like that, you know, and um, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt sure. do this. Um, the morality in the New Testament, to me, is typified by that thing of uh, people were going to stone a woman. I think she was a prostitute or something. They were going to throw stones. And Jesus says, let the person without sin throw the first stone. Now, he hasn't actually sort of said you mustn't throw stones or you must throw stones. He's given them a sort of dilemma. You know, okay, if you've never sinned yourself and you throw a stone, it's making him think. And um, that's a different sort of morality. And then, um, so I compare that with uh, when a toddler, you know, reaches for the stove or something, you say, don't touch. You don't give them a lecture on fire and all that sort of thing. Sure. Thing. You just tell them what they can and what they can't. Now, when they sort of more like a, an eight-year-old or something, uh, you can't get away with giving these commands to the same extent. So you tend to call on their better nature. You say, look, eat up your food because other people in the world are starving. They haven't got food. Or your mother loved you and she ate this food, so you ought to try it. Um, now, what's happening there is that they're sort of saying... Um, follow our example. They're trying to be perfect people. You know, mummy made that and she loves it, therefore you should eat it. You know, um, daddy uh, goes and does this, that, and the other, and he's big and strong and he's doing the right thing. So it's, 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 it's um, to people that there is an answer. It is to try to be a perfect person. And that really is very Christian because there's a famous book um, you know, on the imitation of Christ which basically is how to Christ. And it's the idea there is a perfection that we must aspire to. So what is the end of Horus then? Well, in those, it must be like the teenage where you rebel. 
And there's a lot of that rebelliousness in, you know, the third chapter of the book of the law. In fact, it's, it's bloody obnoxious in places, you know, the things it says. Um, and what I see in that is that uh, we're entering an age where we must be wary of perfection. Um, and you get this thing where people um, are searching for a guru who's perfect. You know, one of the saddest things for me, I remember, you know, wake, I might meet a friend I haven't seen for a long time. How are you getting on? Oh, I found this brilliant guru. He's, he's amazing. He, he, you know, um, that's the end of my searching. I, I've, and then you go back a year later. How are you getting on with your guru? Oh, that bastard. You know, he was sleeping with his acolytes. You know? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> and you say, but what about all the inspiration he gave you? Oh, no, I won't touch him. There's a... People, um, I think, are still thinking in that middle way that they're looking for something perfect that they can follow perfectly. And I think what the message of the Aeon of Horus is that um, no one is perfect. Uh, it's more up to you and your judgment. And... Um, so in the case of, I mean, Alistair Crowley himself is a good example. Sure. Um, uh, I don't think he would have been a good friend of mine. Um, it's too much about him that I don't like. But it doesn't make me want to reject the things in his writing that I found brilliant and I found helpful and illuminating. Um, so I can pick and choose of what I think is really good and what works for me um, from that. And I think that that really is the way forward. And so I'd say to someone who's, you know, been a Rajneesh person who now despises him, I'd say, well, don't lose the good things he taught you. You know, that's, that's they're part of you now. Um, treat everything else with caution, but don't throw away what was good there. And I think that's, that's um, very much the way we need to go forward. Um, I think the example I gave was like um, I compared it with solving a, an equation, you know, and, and the iterative method. When uh, what you do is you try a solution. It, right, you see, if you if you go back to the old way, the Bible says this. I'll do that. Doesn't matter what happens. I've done the right thing. Sure. You know, um, that's very absolute. Whereas if you say uh, um, I like what it says in the Bible, thou shalt not kill. So I'm going to try and live, I live not killing. Then you get some sort of situation where um, there's someone just about to machine gun a crowd of children, you know, and you've got a pistol in your hand. Um, do you say, I shall not kill and, and leave him to do his murder? Or do you say, in this case, I think I'm going to shoot him? And what you've done is you've taken a stand, I'm not going to kill, but you've kept your eyes open for your, your decision. And so there could come a time when, because you own that decision, you decide, actually, it's better to change it. And then you become a, a sort of part of an evolving reality. You're building your morality, getting towards your true will closer. And so um, that, to me, is the positive. In the, in, you know, people who get worried about the the new way, say it's relativism, there's no absolutes, this, that, and the other. Um, I think there is one absolute, and that is your own sense of integrity, which you hope grows with each time you have to rethink your morality and the choices you made. Yeah, that, that, that relates to, to that question, I think. So, you know, for Rajneesh, um, realize what was good and hold on to that it's valuable and realize what is not worth copying because he wasn't perfect. I mean, literally to, to tag on to the Alistair Crowley example, like there's an example I also feel like binary thinking will utterly wreck anyone who attempts to apply it because either you think everything he did was wonderful and you can excuse every action he ever took. Somehow you can even spin it into like, you know, it was part of his magical will or something like that, you know? And then you end up with, yeah. I mean, we kind of discussed this on the first interview we did. We end up with the Thelemites who 
I mean, my analogy was like they're the biggest fans ever of the Rolling Stones from the 1970s and they don't want to hear any new music. They just want to hear the classics over and over again. And that was it. That was music <laughs> for them. So the other angle, obviously, yeah. is, well, we can we can show that he did some horrible things. So he's an arsehole. Therefore, what he said is nonsense. He couldn't be a mystic. He couldn't be a prophet. He couldn't be any of these things because, I mean, in this worldview, arseholes can't do those things. I mean, I think one thing I would say that I always mm. felt like was misunderstood, it's one of the few areas I thought Robert Anton Wilson actually uh, kind of um, highlighted something new about Crowley that other people didn't really notice, even though I do think he had his own predilections in how he explained that, that maybe overly so made Crowley seem soft to people and made him seem like a hippie icon that he maybe wasn't always, that he, he was definitely had a right-wing authoritarian streak in him. But I would say this, is mm. Crowley to me is like a spiritual version of that very, very famous metaphor of the scorpion and the frog, where the whole lesson of the, well, one of the lessons you can take from it, whether, you know, the frog, a scorpion says, you know, give me a ride over the river. And then the frog says, oh, yeah. All right, then, yeah, sure, but you won't sting me with it. And he goes, well, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a scorpion, but nah, mm. yeah, you know what? Nah, I won't sting you. I, I promise not to. And then, you know, as he's in the middle of the river, as, mm. it, as people know, the scorpion stings him. As they're drowning, both of them, well, as the frog's going down, he sort of says, mm. I mean, why have you done that? Like, we're both going to die now. And then the other guy basically says, I'm a scorpion. Like, That's what I do. Like, the crazy thing about Crawley to me was <laughs> he's someone who essentially mm. is telling you gurus are human, they're fallible, they have a mystical side, and guess what? They want your money, they want to be in your mm. ass, they want they want it all because they're people who, on the one hand, mm. they're drawing you to them with, with, with an amazing part of their personality or who they are, but the very flawed part will also take mm. over. But in his world, like from what I gleaned mm. from his reading, he just has a much more harsh morality than I do where his, his perception seems to be if you let him do that to you, mm. if you willingly give him your money access to your wife yeah. access to you you almost deserve mm. it like he thinks there's on seems to think there's almost like a rationale to that where yes. it's like there's almost a universal principle there. yes yeah it's uh, um just in terms of what i was saying it's almost like he's he's testing people for that independent judgment um to see whether they're still hooked on perfection so if they just do everything he says as far as he's concerned, oh, they're just, you know, end of Osiris people, try perfect. Um, and um, someone's just come to the door, but I, I think my wife is going to answer it. So, uh, um, yeah, so you could say he's actually testing them with his own criterion. You know, are these people aware enough to draw the line? Or are they just... Um, so... Yeah, that's. Mm. Yeah, right. Yeah, since we were talking about the angle that um, Crawley essentially, I mean, in this case, this is something he did in some degree take from the great gurus of the East and all the legends is like he was kind of like the harshest test ever. Like, you know, if you get the test wrong, oh, yes. I mean, he figuratively mm. is bonking you on the head with a cane and he doesn't explain necessarily why. Mm. You just have to learn from that. And if you're the kind of person who. Oh yes, it constantly says things like get head with a cane. Yeah, it's going to be a rough life for yeah. you. But I, I think actually mm. you can even see that there is almost an efficacy in some of his. I, I agree with you. I couldn't do those things. Like even if I think that that's reasonable, as in there's a logic to it, I can't bring mm. myself to do that. I'm too much of a softy. Mm. But one area yeah. I would say there's almost an efficacy mm. in it is whenever people hear of the meetings of the great mystics and magicians of time, and obviously Crowley himself got to meet, in theory, I believe people claim he briefly met Gurdjieff. Obviously, he had a relationship with mm. Austin Osmond Spare. He knew a number of people in mm. the Golden Dawn, etc. You know, this is a person who met some of the other great characters. Now, when people as a fantasy put together a meeting of two great minds like that, they want them to get along and have a great time. But actually, I think if you notice, all these people who also mm. would be claimed as great mystical thinkers they tend to actually repel each other like either if not in the short term like apparently spare and crowley had a relationship oh, for a while yes. eventually they do repel each other like in in some mm. senses they don't ever fall into that yeah. trap in the same way and that seems somehow somehow essential to ever charting mm. your own course otherwise you think of the great thinkers who essentially put themselves below one of these figures as that's their guru they do t somehow sort of get mm. trapped in their shadow in a very in very literal sense, even even in terms of their thinking. Mm. Yes, that's um, 
That's true. I haven't really thought about the interactions between them very much. I know, I think Crowley and Steiner had some interaction, Rudolf Steiner. Oh, and of okay. course, that was why I was very denied by the um, anthroposophists because, you know, they saw Crowley as very, very negative. Sure. Um, but um, two, two examples that I thought was interesting. I know Gurdjieff, one of his concerns was what happens when the guru goes? You know, does the movement fossilize um, or does someone take over like a dictator, as happened with Rajdish? Um, and so he sort of uh, walked out on his, on his movement um, and uh, because he wanted to see what happened if he deserted them um, before he actually died. So, you know, to, to to help him to understand and perhaps take precautions to make sure the movement didn't go rotten when he left. And something similar was Steiner, because uh, Steiner only wrote very few books. I think just one or two books he wrote. But if you go to a, a Steiner library, there's rows and rows and rows and rows of books, which is all lecture lectures he gave. Sure. Now, I was told that when he started giving these lectures, which were very inspirational and, and, you know, full of new ideas, uh, they said, oh, you know, can, you, can we write it down? He said, no, I don't want it written down because I want this to be a living um, movement. Uh, I want it to be living and growing. But after a while, they said, no, please. This is too good. We don't want to lose it. We must write it down. They insisted. They wrote it down. Now, I taught at a, a Steiner school, and you know, a Waldorf school, and uh, that was in the uh, 70s, yes. And it was true that the older generation of teachers that were very dogmatic, um, you know, they would do things by the book. Steiner would have said this. Steiner didn't approve of, of recorded music, so we won't allow it. Now, um, the younger ones would say, yeah, well, when Steiner was disapproved of recorded music, well, that was when records were scratchy discs, you know, which um, were a very poor substitute for live music. But if you're going to talk about par Wagner's Parseval, which is a very important thing for the study, and you can't put on a really good hi-fi record of it to help the children to get to f understand it then you're limiting them so in other words um uh there was this he wanted to keep it living and alive and, and moving um but there's this huge tendency which again goes to the idea of perfection oh you know we must we write it all down just make sure it's in writing um and you get people doing that with crowley to some extent you know um did he say this or did he not say this? Well, we must have the reference and the date yes. and exactly what he said and, and try to get it right and everything. And um, it's, it's, again, it's the two things. I, I think there's definitely a place for that. You know, if someone started saying um, Crowley was a fluffy New Asia, uh, I'd think of plenty of examples where he wasn't. Sure. Um, but uh, if um, to say, no, no, you can't, you, you can't say you're a thelemite and still believe in this, that, and the other because Crowley said this. Uh, I, would, I would say, well, that's rubbish, you know. I, I'll decide if I'm a thelemite. Um, uh, I, it's a living faith and it's it lives within me in, in, in my own way. I may not be the best thelemite in the world. I may not be a good example, but um, I still can call myself a thelemite because I believe a lot of the principles are correct. Along those lines, then, I, I quite, another question I have is right, I guess this actually ties back into uh, one of the first things we talked about, the angle of the viruses and spreading and the concept of ideas spreading. Another yes. thing that's very interesting mm. to me is whenever these great mystics and magicians of history come to some amazing epiphany, a model of the world, a way of explaining themselves, right? they always seem in the moment so certain that this is going to change the world, right? When everyone else gets a taste of what I've experienced, mm. what I've seen, like it has to change and transform the way it's transformed me. It actually reminds me somewhat of mm. if anyone's done, I mean, your generation will know this, like a, even just a basic dose of psilocybin mushrooms. 
it's it's a very common mm. experience that in the calm down you are thinking like oh my god I've accessed like universal idea this is going to be amazing when I tell people mm. and then when you tell people you yourself start th- hearing yourself saying stuff like yeah it's like we're all one man and you know there's there's no separation <laughs> and then you even as you're saying it you're thinking this is shit like these 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 words aren't doing anything for me even I'm hearing it and going that's not what I was thinking and that sounds that sounds rubbish yeah, so there's yeah. almost a problem mm. where when I look at it because one of the one of the most famous came came, um, came let me think arguments against the efficacy of of the cult techniques is well if they really worked mm. why didn't you just you know take over the world become the most successful person why didn't everyone you encountered learn this from you and transform mm. the whole world consciousness and I have to say as depressing as it sounds if you look at the ideas that are ubiquitous. Mm. The world of marketing tells us they tend to be the most watered down versions of the same idea. They just strip out a lot of the intense elements because that's, you know, that's what will stop Mm. someone getting into the idea. They might not, they might even have the tools to be able to start to appreciate it. So in a weird sense, it's it's kind of, there's almost a logic as to why the great occultists will always remain a cult and why if they don't, Mm. they're almost not doing occultism anymore. If if that premise makes sense. Mm. <coughs> yes, it's. Um, I mean, I, 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 you could say that about the occult. You know, if you if you've got all these amazing, you know, why aren't you ruling the universe? And it's it's actually there's an equivalent for the rationalist. You say, if you're so clever, why aren't you rich? You know, why is <laughs> sure. wasn't Einstein the richest man in the world? You know, why is um, uh, they, they make a certain amount of money, but they're not as rich as as the richest people. So um, it's a question of. Um, you know what you're really aiming for now i think a lot of people might get into magic thinking they're going to make a lot of money or something like that but um in the process you actually find other things that are more value you know, you're finding yourself in a way which um is other things are more interesting i mean i at present my life is very hard and i've have a lot of setbacks in that and um people sometimes say well can't you do a spell or something and we'll banish the demon and i'm still finding it very interesting i find the struggle is still rather intriguing and religious people can do the same thing once they've decided that they're being tested by god <laughs> they can put up with a hell of a lot you know it's sort of because they find it strengthening so um there are, there are many ways of experiencing um, apart from just trying to optimize or maximize, I should say, optimize is a broader word. Sure. And um, uh, now, what was it? I was uh, something I wanted to say about that. Yes, um, the the. Uh, I mean, the start part was about how occult ideas, essentially, it almost feels like something about Ah, their lifespan means they can't get to everyone. Mm. Like, everyone can't become a super next-level adept. Like, it just doesn't feel like that's possible, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I do have a sense, you know, uh, people say, do you believe in reincarnation? Well, I need to believe in it, really. It doesn't, (laughs) life doesn't make sense if you only get one chance. You know, what about a baby who who falls off the pram and dies, you know? Um, So I need to believe in it. And um, so I feel that... uh, um, like, I didn't, I didn't hit jackpot with the Abramelin operation. I learned a hell of a lot, and it was very, very important in my life. But I feel that I'd probably got as much as I could in this incarnation, and uh, I'll need to do it again in, in another lifetime. You know, there's a long way to go. And actually, I'd ra- as an explorer, I'd rather have a long way to go than to feel I've oh, arrived and this yeah, is the end of it have, all. You don't want to found everything. It's going to ruin the, yeah. the fun of it. Yeah. But the another side of it is that um, I always emphasize that magic is very much um, the individual end of the spectrum, whereas religion and science is, is the group area, you know, um, the group thing. So um, if you've had an amazing experience, uh, its real value is to you. And if you think... Um, Wow, I'm going to, I go to tell the scientists that I've had a, you know, I've seen God. Um, 
and then it, you, as you say, this sort of deflation. You know, God, it does sound stupid when I start describing it. Sure. Um, you you're not making the best use of that experience generally, um, and people who approach magic in an attempt to prove that science is wrong to me they're as stupid as people who do science in order to prove that god doesn't exist yes you can do science and show that we can get along without believing in god but you can't actually prove he doesn't exist um by doing science so, and so yeah so i i feel that um i agree with you it's uh Part of us wants to share the wonderful things we've experienced and the meaningfulness. Yes, we want to share that huge sense of meaning, but there's very few people who are so in tune with you that they would really get what you're talking about. And I think perhaps art is a wonderful thing that helps to bridge that gap. Um, I always uh, have this idea that, you know, when the start of an art, artistic operation is very like a magical one you have a sort of a sense of incompleteness something needs to be done you know uh, it may be an inner urge or you may feel um the world needs something and you make something or do something you know depending whether you're an actor or, or a sculptor or a musician um and you feel satisfied you've you've you you know you've expressed yourself or i think that no one's ever completely Completely satisfied, you know, it could be better, but I think this does the job. And to me, the key thing is when um, you step back from it, and then someone over your shoulder says, Wow, that's terrific. And you realize what you did out of a personal need is actually seen as valuable by another person. And that's the sort of the transition from magic to art to me that um, uh, more and more people say wow that is amazing that painting that play that movie or whatever it is and that is what sort of defines its art it's, it's got a universal meaning which other people can take but a piece of magic may only be really meaningful for the one person you know who did it uh, sure. but art sort of reaches out into society and that is a, a amazing thing for me and in that sense i say art goes beyond back get in it but goes further what about this then so obviously in your work as an author which i mean you alluded to before obviously you've been a teacher at schools and you've done some other things at times and you had to support yourself via that method but now people will mainly know you mm. as an author and particularly on this very mm. niche subject of occultism and magical thinking and these sorts of topics right as it was sometimes when i think back on the lives of the great mystics of, for example, obviously the 19th, the 20th century, the early part, I often, it's very easy to think, oh, well, the reason why it was so niche back then is because, you know, they didn't, like, they only just had the printing press for a few hundred years. They didn't have the internet. They, you know, books were more <laughs> expensive. But, mm. but actually, I don't think that's accurate. Again, in line with what we're talking about here, mm. some of these ideas never will spread too far or they'll never be the end mm. point that reaches the person. Maybe they're the inspiration that inspires another person, that inspires another person, that then what they do is at some sort of level mm. that people can can consume. Now, obviously, one thing you've just alluded to essentially there is it's the, it's the old retort to the parent who, out of kindness to you, actually says, don't become an artist. You'll end up starving and dead in the street. That's what happens to mm -hmm. all of them. You know, on the, if you're the kid, you go, mm -hmm. screw that. You know, I'll make it and I'll do it. But really, the, re the real retort, if you go through the artistic lifestyle, is you're right. I was starving and I did have to go through some hard times. But literally the experience of, of doing the art was, was the reward. Like, you know, if I'd have got some money on the side, great. Mm -hmm. But if not, like... That was better to me in this particular case, mm. if we draw a very extreme example, than, you know, doing a soul-destroying office job that maybe you don't want to do. But what what I want to ask mm. essentially was, most of these ideas, like I said, if they ever get out to the, the more mainstream world, the wider world, it is through a very circuitous path and they tend to be watered down or assimilated in a way people can understand. What has that been like in your mm. own personal experience in as much as when you've written some of these books... 
I mean, I'm I'm amazed mm-hmm. that they're not better well known, and I'm not saying that obviously just to be sycophantic. Mm-hmm. I mean, legitimately, I, mm-hmm. I I can think of so many mm-hmm. artistic people who would get different ideas and perspectives. I think it could also like one thing I've mm-hmm. always enjoyed about your essays is they remind me of that technique that Brian Eno invented called like oblique cards or something and he basically made a set of cards with different instructions mm. and you know one of them oh, would yes. say something like reverse the premise or delete your last thing mm. and go back to the you know and the idea was if you got creatively <laughs> stuck you would draw a card and whatever it said it was just a technique you could oh, try yes. to get yourself out of a rot so i'm amazed it's not more well known so how has it been in that respect mm. that on the one hand you're putting out these ideas into the world and they certainly find a home with some people but I mean, it mm. does. You, you, I'm sure you've come to, to grips with it yourself. You're never going to be mm. Dan Brown and have everyone read Ramsey Duke's main book. I mean, the closest you could maybe come is mm. maybe someone really famous. I mean, I'll give you a ridiculous example, like Kanye mm. West or something. Maybe he reads uh, Ramsey Duke's book and goes, tweets out, Can't, Ramsey, Duke's, Ramsey Duke's is the shit. Like, that's about the closest <laughs> we could ever get, I think, to global consciousness <laughs> of Ramsey. So what do you think on this topic? Mm. Like, how have you been able to, to yeah. process that? Have you come to any conclusions from it? Mm. Well, um, I think it was it last time we talked about the, the way I started writing my very first book. Yeah. Um, which I haven't actually published because it was like a sort of novel, you know, it was an exp- experimental thing. Um, I, uh, in it, the characters sort of died off one by one. And um, uh, Thunder Squeak, um, I wrote as the suicide writings of Ambrose Lee and, uh, and um, Angerford. Um, Liz yes. Angerford, that's it. Um, I sort of had a feeling that um, I was killing off writer because I sense that people um, read a dead author differently to how they read a living author. Um, I, I think there's some truth in that. You know, um, you, you hear people talking about a new book by someone and you skim through it thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder what his next book is going to be about. Um, whereas if it's an author that's dead and you find this book, there's a different way you approach it somehow. And so I, I sort of felt I, I'd love to know what happens to my books after I've died. <laughs> Someone. <laughs> um, one of the things which um, uh, my style is not academic, you know, I don't put footnotes and um, references in a big way. And um, sometimes I'm quite cheeky about it. I put sort of fake footnotes and things like that. (laughs) Um, And um, uh, one of the things that's interesting to me, and I'm a bit out on a a limb here, but I'm told that the occult is getting a foothold in academia. Um, Now, in the past, it would have been to talk about, as you call the occult, in a university um, would be, you know, they'd think you're ridiculous. And the only way they admit it is if you did something about magic as an aberration, you know, sort of, um, uh, I've done some research into why people believed in magic in the 16th century, you know. Oh, dear, you know. So so you could get away with it like that. Now, I had a friend, Nick Goodrick, who was one of the early people um, who set up in Exeter University um, now, you couldn't call it Course on Magic. He called it something like the Western Esoteric Tradition. <laughs> sure, um, great. that's a great euphemism. And, yeah. and so there was this department, which actually had people like Christopher McIntosh that coming and lecturing in it. Um, and I went to visit him once. Um, and I said, you know, wow, that's amazing. You know, uh, how uh, are you accepted in academia? He said, well, not really. Um, we are seen as the crazies, you know, okay, we've got our foot in the door, but um, uh, they still don't consider it a respectable academic subject. Now, that was about 2000, I think. Um, But since then, uh, um, there's a thing called academia.edu, and the number of articles coming out about um, Crowley and this, that, the other, and you find there are the departments in universities around the world, which, again, tend to sort of call it terrorism and things like that, but some of them are actually um, practicing missions, and, um, you know, uh, are writing this stuff. And I find that's very interesting. And I think that um, 
I would like to, well, one person, there was a conference in Germany, I think, last year, and the person, um, Rafał Prink, a Polish guy, who did a translation of my book, SSOT BME, into Polish, okay. way back around about 1980, he gave a lecture to, uh, and it was on an esoteric s subject, you know, in this sort of field of research. And he gave a lecture where he talked about my book and my ideas. And I thought, now that's very interesting because that's reaching an audience that um, I felt excluded from. Um, and I'd be very interested to see how that develops. You know, whether... Um, the, do, do you know the... Do you know the podcast series called Weird Studies? No, I don't. Weird Studies. I really recommend it. Um, it's two guys, um, Phil Ford and J.F. Martell. And um, they, one of the early ones, they interviewed me because Phil Ford says he was very much influenced by my writing. Okay. Now, he's an academic, but his subject is mus musicology. So a lot of their stuff is around topics of music and art and things like that. But and then Martel do, seems familiar. Is he, is he some sort of a thalamite or something? Um, I don't think so, no. He's not but a he's, cult guy, he's a, he, he's a, he's a film, film. He makes ah, okay. uh, he's involved with film work and music, I think. Um, and, um, but he, you know, they talk about magic quite a bit. And, and in one of them, actually, they interview me about um, an article... I wrote in the 80s called the the charlatan and the magus oh, on this very best. question yeah. we've been talking about you know about um uh the question of why a guru can yes. be flawed and yet still have a lot of wisdom to pass on you know um that was one of the early ones of that series but it's interesting because um phil in particular has written some quite academic things around these themes and he said that he gave a course um, in the university and I can't remember what the theme of it was but it was a broader thing and one of the books on their reading list was SSOT beer <laughs> and I don't think he's just been kind to me he said a lot of the students said that was the best book on the course the one they enjoyed the most you know, sure. and, and thought was most illuminating and I was very thrilled with that because um, I really, I really would like to speak to people who, um, well, I especially like people who would like to believe in magic but find they can't, you know, and if I help sure. them, that is terrific. The next best thing is people who don't really believe in magic and don't understand why people could believe in magic, but are open-minded enough to listen, you know, and then... At the other end of the spectrum, there are the people who don't believe in magic and they don't want anything that might persuade them to believe in magic or, sure. or to accept magic. Yeah. <laughs> and those people uh, I, I have no hope with. But, um, uh, I, I'm interested in the ones who are more open. You know, when you say that about it being taught in courses now and it being somewhat like accepted into academia, it's allowed to carve out its own place, that immediately makes mm. me actually think that I, I just imagine what your old mate Gerald Schuster would think about that. Someone oh, yeah. who obviously remember, like, I mean, it was the fact that mm. he was trying to be in the academic world and have this occult life, and the fact that it was so easy to mm. kind of scare people with that. That essentially was was one of the horrible things that happened in his life. I'm sure it would be a revelation to him that this could could even be possible. Yeah. Yes, he would love it because it's interesting because he. Uh, was so attracted to the idea of a proper intellectual discourse, you know, and rigid, uh, rigorous, not rigid thinking and things like that. Um, but he also rebelled against it, you know. Um, if people sat around in our thing, the society, um, talking t too academically about magic, you know, is it true that Crowley met Gurdjieff at some date, you know, and, and did they talk about this, that, and the other? He would thump the table and say, Where's the magic? <laughs> in other words sure. yeah, you know he was sort of this is dry stuffy stuff and everything like that so he I, I, he was really divided like that part of him longed for the respectability of um you know 
good like, discussions and and um, books being printed and things like that. And part of him was rebelling against it as stuffy stuff, you know. But um, but um, the, the I think the transition I was describing is from the idea that you, first of all um, you don't mention magic; it's got no place in academia. To well, yes. Um, you can talk about uh, magic as an aberration, you know, a, a human folly, and look for reasons as to why people fell for this nonsense. And the next level is, um, okay, magic is a bit stupid, but it is actually an important cultural influence. You know, many artists and writers and things have been, and even Newton himself um, had his foot in this stuff. So uh, it's worth looking at as an important influence, even if we admit that it, it's, you know, it's all past and stupid. And then the next step is um, magic actually is a living part of human society, um, uh, which many people don't accept, but it is playing a role. It is has relevance nowadays to the way people are thinking and, so, and the things like marketing and all that, you know, we talked about. Um, and then, that all those steps are <coughs> actually sort of saying, yeah, I'm a magician, you know. And I think it's interesting. I think they're along that path. They're going towards, um, I think the present state is saying uh, it's it's a bit weird, but um, it is an important part of human society that needs to be studied. I think that's where they are now. Sure. Mm. Actually, you, you touched on a topic there. I thought would be a nice final topic. Obviously, I don't want to take too much of your time. I appreciate it, though. Which is, um, I'll, so I'll give you a quick analogy. One thing that I found very interesting when I was exploring the world of psychedelics was this notion that one of the most now world-famous psychedelics, ayahuasca from the South American jungles, the premise is, mm. and listen, again, I'm, I'm really an, an anecdote here. I've not explored this to know whether this is the case or not. But it's, it sounds mm. like a brilliant story, which if anyone's listened to this conversation so far, is kind of what we're into. So let's go with it for now. So the premise goes, mm. and the reason why ayahuasca must have some sort of, you know, access to some realm that isn't just folly isn't just colors flashing behind your eyes mm. and a nonsense misfiring of your brain which is what a lot of people would try and mm. diminish it as one of the the ideas mm. that it has an efficacy to it as a drug is that supposedly the amazon is so dense with plants that the fact that ayahuasca has to be mm. made of two plants one is this vine of a tree but that that essentially if you take mm. it as a as a, a food will just be broken down by enzymes in your stomach and you will not experience mm. anything psychedelic so what you have to have is you have to have this other thing called an MAOI inhibitor and you have to take that this other mm. plant put them together stir them together mm. heat them you know do all this stuff with it and then the end product the ayahuasca which is actually kind of like an amalgam mm. basically is then what will have this incredibly powerful psychedelic effect so the the, the question goes mm. among all these plants like that how did the people who were just these mm. again you know in our yes, world, primitive yes. people how did they find that these two work together mm. and again like the language yeah. example given earlier they'll just tell you oh yeah mm. um you know the spirits told us that they told us to put these two things together so obviously mm. that sounds yes. that sounds really off the wall in that respect right but then yeah. i was actually thinking yes um wait there one second let me think where i was going with this what was the analogy that for that what was that analogy supposed to lead to <laughs> wait there one second i have a good one here well i could pick up on, on one, one thing is yeah, it, yeah, would go it ahead. help if I'll, I, I'll see if i'll see if i can think of it while you're um, telling me i think i th to me that's incredibly beautiful you know that combining the two plants when there are so many plants there um uh what a lovely thing that as you say you might happen to chew one plant to discover it's got properties to find that you need two different plants now that to me is very special and i i suppose i'm thinking back to what we were saying earlier about um you know having a conversation with the world thinking of the tree as a living thing that might actually um, be worth respecting and um, trying to communicate with. Um, I know my experience of taking the psilocybin mushroom was very enhanced having read about someone's theory that it's tendrils under the earth, which is the main part of it. Um, you know, the, the thing you actually eat is just a tiny little fruiting bod. Yes. The thing itself yes. is under the earth. It's, better. It might it's like the mycelium synapses network, yeah. in the brain. 
Exactly. Yes, yeah, so right. It's like the synapse of the brain, and therefore, it's like that huge brain under us by giving us this experience. Now, that sort of really resonated in me as, as a plant lover. Uh, uh, when I thought about that analogy, I could almost feel it chiming in my heart. You know, yes, yes, yes. Um, and I think I, 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 th I think of that when you describe that of finding two things which go together. I sort of imagine them at um, some point in the jungle and sort of listening to the plants and feeling some sort of strange affinity between two of them um, and wanting to try them together. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things you can't really explain very well, but it, it just feels very, very good, that, that story. Um, and... Uh, I think there's even yeah. something to the to the example you gave, actually, in as much as you then look at what tends to come out of the experience of taking these mushrooms, and probably the most infamous consensus epiphany people have is like, oh my God, where I live is one, you know, ecosystem, and I need to be a part of it, and you know, like, it's like, if anything, like, mm. if, if you were a mycelial network that wanted to make a bunch of these, we'll just use a ridiculous example of monkeys that are running around fucking everything up. The best way you could give mm. them that message would be have them eat this fruit that they want, the mushroom, and then they get a mm. little experience that tells them like, you know, it's like kind of a mixture of a slap on the wrist and sort of like, come along, don't you want to have fun the way we're supposed to be doing it, you know? <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yes, it's... Um... No, I think that's that's amazing. That uh, it touch on something else. You know, um, I've talked about sort of academia. Um, it's ideas evolving around magic, and they haven't got to accepting it yet. But you know, sure. they're now seeing it as something important, even if it is still a bit stupid. Um, the when I give the thing about, you know, we are evolving way 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 back we had magical thinking and then um you know artistic thinking and then religious thinking and now at last we know the truth it's science um uh in the 50s when i was was growing up the idea really was that all those other things are primitive you know science is the only way forward it's the only way we should be thinking sure. and even if we need art it's a bit of a weakness you know and it's sort of soon we'll get computers that will make music for us and all that you know um now um people now uh well there's two authors in particular one is a person who wrote a book called something like seven secrets of magical thinking and another was I can't remember his name, but he wrote a book called Homo Sapiens, Sapiens. Now, they've taken a slightly different angle. They still see these things like religious thinking and the belief that you can actually will changes and um, art. They still see them as sort of primitive um, things along the path of evolution, but they see that they have value. In other words, rather than saying religious thinking is utterly stupid, they say, well, it's a thing that gave us big survival value because it gave us this herd instinct which united humans together against other animals, you know, and, and so things like that. So they look back on these things as something that natural selection evolved, which gave us survival value. But I haven't heard them apply that to endpoint scientific rational thinking because maybe that is something which evolved to give us um, to give us survival value which doesn't mean it's the truth sure. it's a, just like religion and anything else it's something that has evolved because it's got survival value and so it might actually be just as erroneous as the previous ways of thinking just as erroneous as magical thinking just as erroneous as artistic thinking just as erroneous as religious thinking in their terms so if you accept that, it's just something else that the brain has evolved to do to increase its survival. It doesn't have to relate to truth at all. Um, maybe causality is a complete fallacy. You know, maybe things happen synchronously um, and we just have been, um, we've evolved our brains to put them in a sequence and say this causes this. Maybe the whole objective reality which we share with other people, maybe that's a complete illusion too. Maybe we're all part of a huge computer program, you know. Um, our perception 
uh, which we think is the the height of our awareness and you know and the truth we've reached at, that might just be another um, fish, uh, evolution developed in our brains in order to give us a survival advantage, and it might be nothing to do with truth at all. And that's an extraordinary thought to me, because it means that when you take um, you know, psilocybin or, or some um, uh, psychedelic drug, you might actually be uh, perceiving the world as it really is, yes. without all these structures that our thinking, our brains put upon it. You might be opening the door to what's really there. You know, it's just an intriguing idea to me. Um, it's sort of... Uh, that idea that our rationalism might just be the next step in the brain um, finding survival means um, a new the latest illusion it's giving us to help our survival um, <laughs> I find that very interesting because it throws the whole thing open again oh, what actually, is reality I mean I, I couldn't pick up the thread of what I had before so let's not worry about it but I'll, I'll spin that All into right. a, a, a last point then um, which connects to what you've just said now that's, what, that's where I thought of it which is that actually reminds me of one, again, as I said, when I've been getting into this, basically the, the crazy thing for me is I've sort of come back to Christianity, not as like a religion. Mm. I, I don't think I'll ever be involved mm. in a religion. I just, don't, my, I just don't tend to think along those lines, it seems. But I am very interested mm. in it as like uh, the cultural impact it's had. I think there even are epiphanies that you mm. can find within that as long as you don't get too bogged down in the idea that the whole thing has to be true or it doesn't, which, you know, has been a theme mm. throughout this discussion. And obviously, mm. it's uh, the people that have really helped me um, find an interesting element here and not think that it's just, you know, a bunch of fucked up preachers and idiots that just believe nonsense mm -hmm. have been some of the great writers who were also Christians in this sense. So C.S. Lewis, J.K. K. Chesterton, oh, yes. would be obviously yeah. some, you know, brilliant writers that if you get into them, mm. you almost have to go along with them on the trip mm. of Christianity for, just to enjoy what they're talking about. So I thought a great quote that mm. C.S. Lewis had actually, which I find very hard to refute, and I'd love to get your take on this, is anyone who's at all involved with science it's now become a kind of chauvinism that you must buy into this idea of true and false and these things are proven and these mm. are not proven and this kind of a worldview. But one of the great points that C.S. Lewis made is he said essentially, the gist of it was, if my brain, as the person who's the atheist would claim, evolved and it evolved for reasons that, again, as we're talking about here, might have nothing to do with truth. Mm. Like in the case of the sheep that mm. walks away, that might not even be the, the most effective strategy long term. That might just be a strategy that worked mm. one time. It might be the survivorship bias. Yeah. Right? If essentially my brain mm. evolved in that way, then how can I say that reasoning myself to that point in time proves the things I'm saying because reason itself, I have no, re there's no basis to it. It never had, it can never dig oh. down and find a foundation. And I thought this is actually an incredible yes. point because essentially yeah. yes. you have to, on some level, even if you're a, a scientist, they almost need to reconnect to like platonic ideas that there are some ideas that really do exist in or the platonic shape. You know, there's some, there's got to be some foundational mm. aspect that they can build off. Otherwise they are just a dog chasing their own tail. How do you, how do you consider that? <clears throat> wow, that's amazing. I mean, <laughs> I can't really add to that. It's, um, it, I mean, it, it actually reflects just what I've been saying too. I mean, I say reflects is what I was saying reflects that. You know, the um, the uh, if our brains have evolved in this way to see the world in this way, is it just a clever bit of evolution rather than a truth? You know, amazing. Um, I mean, I'm most impressed that he. He said that said that way back then. Um, it's amazing, just, isn't it? Yeah. Sort of, you know, the um, the sort of you know, think of a very advanced thinkers, and you realise that they were keen Christians. Again, on weird studies, I heard them talking about um, Marshall McLuhan. Now, oh, that's the sort favorites. of person who, yeah, you think of him as yeah, a, a revolutionary sort of um, postmodernist, you know. Um, someone very much uh, the, the modern, you know, latest He's on way. the cutting edge, yeah, of course. Well, pe yeah, cutting edge, that's it. But he was a, quite a passionate Catholic, apparently. Sure. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, they, they s the example they gave, and I, I, can't, I probably can't repeat it because, I, you know, it's quite subtle, was um, the medium is the message. He saw... Christ's incarnation in those terms, 
you know, the word becoming God. Um, sure. And there was a very interesting discussion around that. And they said not many people know that actually he was, um, you know, a dedicated Catholic uh, all through his life. And I thought that's intriguing. You know, this is it's basically it's, there's a lot to be explored in that area. <laughs> yeah, I haven't gone well, far I mean, down that, that definitely, but it's, it's an intriguing idea. That definitely mm. ties into some of the ideas we've obviously just discussed, that essentially if you use secular mm. language mm. and models to just tell people about magic and the upside, they start to get really interested and go, mm. wow, what's this new field you invented? What's it called? Western Hermetic Tradition. Oh, that's mm. interesting. It sounds Renaissance. You know? <laughs> if you tell them it's magic, they mm. think it's nonsense. You've actually, amazingly, you've saved me here, Ramsey, because you've actually made me realize what my point was going to be about the ayahuasca angle. So here's the way I was setting it up. Oh, yeah. In the same way as in that case, the implication was that even the knowledge to access this particular drug, they claim came from the spirit world. Like it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't like they built a drug and they accessed the mm. spirit. Like, whoa, what's going on here? It's like they claim it was the other way around, right? Mm. Well, similarly, mm. if you ever listen to any of, uh, watch a documentary, read a very simple biography of Isaac Newton's a great example. I'd say Tesla is another brilliant example. Mm. Literally mm. the most next level thinkers that as far as we know have ever existed. And these people were mm. far from stupid. And in fact, as far as I can tell, the way that their brain would even interpret occult topics, they were thinking in similar lines. Well, here's the interesting thing is as far as I can tell, it goes the other way around to what most people would ex uh, imagine, which is that they think Isaac Newton or Tesla, they were doing all this real world science and they were doing a great job there. And then when they, you know, when they were just, they were on their off time, they messed around in this world mm -hmm. of magic and the occult or a wild thought, mm -hmm. just almost as a, as a, mm -hmm. as a dally, <laughs> you know, just some silly, yeah. silly behavior, right? But actually the craziest yeah. thing to me is when you actually go and you read the kind of hermetic thought and alchemy that people like Isaac mm. Newton were into, it's the other way around. Mm. The ideas of concepts mm. like gravitation, these come from like the emerald tablets. These come from concepts like laws of attraction. Like these things legitimately, as far oh, as yes. I can tell, the premise for what he mm. then describes as a scientific principle of the world comes from what mm. they would call the nonsense. Yeah. Like he's actually drawing out yeah. He's performing some sort of a magical mm. alchemy on the idea itself. He's redeeming something that everyone mm. else has said is nonsense. It's a bunch mm. of primitive shit. And he's making it the most advanced thing without which we don't have the computers we're talking with now, the telecommunications, the electricity, all these things. Like Essentially, that, that connection does seem, it seems vital. Yeah. Yes, that's intriguing, isn't it? It's, um, now, yeah. I um I think that um I'm just trying to remember um I'm very bad with names and um you know the guy who's written about John D recently um who's got magic me um, Oh yes Jason oh, Lewis he's kind of like a modern Jason day Jason Lewis that's uh, it yes media that's it now, he, that yeah, sure. he he written up about um John D um rather on those lines of how uh you know um when people I mean his done, idea was that literally the thing. British Empire came out of John Dee's Enochian visions and even that you know things like Silicon Valley yes. might have you know like it was a, it was a quick, yeah. pretty far reaching <laughs> theory. I mean I was loving the idea though. Yes. I'm with you on that. <laughs> That's it, yes. It was it was it was interesting, but he was saying something similar that, you know, um like you've been describing, you know, sort of say Newton, well, he dabbled in a bit of magic on the side, but we'll forgive him. That's a bit like sort of saying, well, actually, he um, he he played with little boys, but you know that was just sort of folly. Sort of thing, you know? Yeah, that's the tone that they say it in. Yeah, a, bit, a little per, little perversion, you know. Um, but um, uh, he was say, he was pointing out how you can't just look at someone like John Dee and and say, um, well, unfortunately, he dabbled in magic on the side. You can actually because it's all part of a great tradition and um it led to many of the things that he's famous for and, and revered for and so he's saying something very similar and um yeah uh, uh, it is amazing and i think very important and i think again it's a sort of it goes with that academic change of heart from uh the occult as being a pathology to being a weakness to being something which has its place in society, even if it is stupid, 
actually being an important thread through cultural history, which is, I think, where we are now uh, in academia's fire, as I understand it, or where we are getting to. Um, sure. And uh, so, so say also on the, on the individual level, you know, um, it wasn't a weakness of Newton's. It was part of his makeup, an important part of what became his ideas. And I can I can go with that. Sure. Right. Well, at the end of this mm. interview, um, obviously your newest book is um, My Years of Magical Thinking. I would encourage anyone who enjoyed this interview, like, check it out. It's basically the same. In fact, most of Ramsey's books are basically great ideas like this that he explores it's just he doesn't have a british guy asking him over and over again why and what's going on and you know he's allowed to just explore the ideas by mm. himself so i'm sure they would enjoy it do you have any final words or a parting message you'd like to give um no i i I've since done a couple of little booklets um uh i started you know because i was doing these videos and um some people said you know gosh could we have this in writing um, and I realize that I can I can get the transcript off um, off the YouTube when it makes <laughs> the subtitles and stuff. Usually, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it's usually pretty bad, but yeah, um, it, it messes some of the names copy that out, Yeah, that's it. And, and I edit down. Um, I've got a series of little little articles. So I did one. The first one was on thoughts on Abram Malin, because a lot of people are asking about that. I had ah, a sort yes. of thread of um, things on Abram Lynn. And, and then I did another one, Thoughts on Post-Truth, because that was a thing that was a hot topic for a while, and I sure. did several things around post-truth and magical thinking. So there are two small booklets on Amazon, um, which uh, are collected, collected essays, but they're based, based on the talks I gave on YouTube. 